invitation and taking efforts to deliver this webinar on technology's responsibilities. Professor Krishna Deo Singh is an associate professor at Jindal Global Law School. He is currently part of the John Monnet Chair at the OP Jindal Global University. He, te he teaches subjects focused on privacy and new technology in European Union, artificial intelligence and ethics of technology. He is writing his doctoral thesis on the relationship between artificial intelligence and eudaimonia and its regulatory implications. Now, without much delay, I would like I would kindly request a professor to speak. Thank you very much, Ashutosh, and um, uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. I'm thrilled to be here, first of all, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak on this particular topic. Uh, before I start, let me give me a minute to share my screen. I do have some slides which uh, will help us kind of navigate through this particular topic. Right. Uh, so the topic is um, ethical responsibility for technology. X ante versus X post approaches. Um, it will become clear uh, over the next, I believe, 45 or so minutes. Um, what exactly do I mean by both of these terms and why am I particularly engaging with these concepts? Um, but, but the larger mandate of what I'm going to be talking today is, is trying to give you a fresh perspective on the regulation of technology um, and also perhaps a connection between regulation of technology as well as ethics of technology. These terms are often used interchangeably, but they are very much different. Um, and you can appreciate the difference by the very underlying nature of the difference between the concepts of regulation and ethics. And yet they are not completely decoupled. They are not completely separate from each other. What is the connection is something that will be explored towards the second half of, of the discussion. But what I hope to achieve through this discussion is to, as I said, give you all of you a fresh perspective to think about how does law, but also how does society at large go about thinking of regulation of technology. Um, so with that broad introduction, um, let me continue. And I, I believe that the first 45 minutes or so will be um, uh, a discussion from my end and the last 15 minutes would be reserved for uh, question and answers and please do feel free to note down your questions and um, I'd kind of put them across to me at the end uh, where I'll be ha more than happy to uh, address those questions. Um, is this fine Ashutosh? Can I proceed? Uh, yeah, sure sir. Everything is fine. Sure. All right. So let's start talking about this, this kind of um, discussion on what regulation of technology is and how do we kind of go about approaching it. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll take a zooming out perspective. I'll start with something very specific and then show you um, by kind of zooming out from there, how does that fit into a larger picture of regulation as well as ethics going about the normativity of technology? How do we address the normativity, normativity uh, surrounding technology? So I'll start with something very, very specific. And this is a good example to start with because this is the kind of the question that I have seen a lot of students ask, a lot of people ask, a lot of academics and scholars ask, uh, where, where, where we start by asking a question which is framed in this particular manner. Look at this question which says, who is responsible in a crash with a self-driving car? Now, there have been incidents of self-driving car crashes in the past. In March 2018, when one of the earliest incidents of such uh, crashes, um, a human being was actually killed and it was an uber self-driving car and the matter is still proceeding um, under, under the, the kind of response from law authorities. But it's a good question to ask because it brings into discussion a lot of elements of technology. Who's to be held responsible? By what standards are to be held responsible? Is, it, is, is a self-driving car going to be uh, treated differently from a regular car? If so, why? If not, so why not? These are the kind of questions that become important. But I'm also interested in understanding the process through which we uh, answer questions like this. One of the first responses that people have is that, and of course, this is um, a discussion where I will keep on invoking 
legal principles because this is this starts with a fundamental legal issue and i think many of you would recognize that one of the first issues that should arise is is this a matter of tort law right is this a matter that should be governed by tort law most people would actually go to that they'll say well okay this is a civil wrong um this is this might very well also be a civil wrong if this were not a self driving car and there was negligence involved so that's why the term negligence here and negligence takes us to the law of torts where we try to address um, the the issue of allocation of responsibility who is responsible and then there thereby we decide that such and such person has to make reparations by payment of damages or through some other means to the person injured or their legal representatives so i will talk a little about the application of these basic rules right let's talk about tort first and then we'll see what other options also exist so tort is like the first go to response when a question like this is asked but when this question is asked there are many specific questions that need to be addressed and this will that and you will notice i will take the example of self driving cars to help us understand especially the more frontier technologies the more uh, sort of cutting edge technologies how are they changing the game now cars have been around for more than 100 years right uh, and and there's a as a there's a very large regime of um, motor vehicle laws and traffic laws that tell us and also principles within tort law concerning motor vehicles and other laws concerning motor vehicles that tell us how to deal with situations like this but what new technology or frontier technologies are doing is that they are changing the game right especially the moment you say self driving car you have taken out the agency that the driver possessed it was almost assumed the laws throughout 20th century and the, even the earliest parts of the 21st century assumed that there's going to be a driver right and that assumption dis- directed what the law would be and this driver possessed agency right by agency what we mean is the fundamental uh capability of taking actions for which we can be held morally and legally responsible now that agency is now being taken away in the uber car crash that happened in 2018 march that i discussed uh, that i talked about earlier the the car driver was sitting but she was actually busy watching television on um you know her mobile phone and the car was driving itself because that was it was that that's something that it was meant to do right so it it was not a, a normal car if this this is these facts were true for a normal car we would have no hesitation in concluding that the person on the driver seat was responsible but we can't jump to that particular conclusion without actually analyzing further uh whether this particular um you know negligence is something that is ascribable to the user not the user in this case is the driver right because they are the person who's who's actually using the technology but because it's a self driving car we actually have to talk about other possibilities when we have to talk about whether it was the designer's negligence right if it is meant to be a car which is self driven uh you go about discovering that it was the designer's fault that the car actually crashed so therefore the, the question will get split into whose negligence we are talking about it would also kind of get complicated because of the nature of duty of care right um duty of care when you are talking about something like a self driving car whose du- duty of care are you talking about do you want to compare this car and its driving skills to the driving skills of other human beings so you kind of set a reasonable person standard right so that's one possibility you say that this car is is um uh, at fault or or the car designer is negligent if the car behaved or responded in a fashion which a reasonable human being would not have uh, responded but now comes another twist to the story that it's not necessary that you want to compare a machine to uh, other people you would have done so had there just been a regular car with a regular driver um but but today you have a self driving car so you might actually want to compare it not with reasonable people but reasonable machine now reasonable machine is not really we are asking a machine to be reasonable but it is just a way of saying that what you are doing is you are actually not comparing this car to other people but you are comparing this car to other machines so what this is what ai driven self uh, driving cars are making us think about it's kind of splitting the questions into 
into ways that have that that were not required for us to do before self driving cars had uh, had become kind of a new thing that 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 is on the horizon there's also the problem of foreseeability negligence and duty of care have traditionally held only those actions responsible which were considered to be reasonably foreseeable right um people were not held responsible for extremely remote damages that they caused due to their actions and that is based upon the principle of foreseeability i i, I should not be held responsible for something that i cannot foresee this is another issue which becomes kind of relevant when we talk about self driving cars why because ai right since ai is present in the self driving car what's happening is uh, ai is now taking more and more decisions and not only is it taking more decisions it's actually continuing to learn continuing to improve and continuing to change itself so the very algorithm that drives the car is improving itself now improvement might not necessarily always be an improvement it might end up learning something which is inherently nonsensical and make a mistake as a consequence and lead to harm and damage as a consequence if all of that happen whether the designer right can be considered to be responsible because whether all of this was foreseeable or not is a question worth asking at the moment i am only focusing on the point that what the frontier technologies are doing is they are forcing us to ask all of these different questions themselves so this is definitely one possibility and as i said this is the starting point where many people will go to but what i'll go on to show you hopefully is that this is not going to be sufficient and why not is something we will discover but there are other possibilities within existing legal principles beyond negligence some might say that when someone is driving a self driven car or someone someone is manufacturing a self driven car they are strictly liable so when you say strict liability it basically goes beyond negligence based liability or fault based liability you are saying that people can be held liable to pay irrespective of whether there was a fault from any party or not there is a variation or iteration of strict liability called product liability this is particularly true for manufacturers of products that enter the market and what it does is it basically brings into the question the concept of defect so what it says is that it's a branch of law so i i'll just kind of read this point out which says that it refers to a system of rules which establish who is liable when a given product causes harm so the first responsible is that the first, first requirement is that there should be a product the second requirement is that there should be harm caused by the product and the third is the harm is caused because the product is defective right once again product liability regime is well established but what we are lacking is a framework for understanding how this applies to self driven cars right because that is the example we are considering so we will have to renegotiate the terms of law we will have to re renegotiate the principles that have been in place for 100 perhaps sometimes it more than a few hundred years in place in order for us to apply it to newer technologies which kind of change the game of agency now the take agency away more and more from the hands of human beings traditionally product liability regimes have had three different types either the defect is in the design or the defect is in the manufacturing or the defect is in the information now let's try to understand each one of them and i'll make a short comment about how this applies to self driving cars even when it comes to design defect um, there are two possible variants of this that 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 are present in the law the first is called the consumer expectations test what it does is that it asks the question under the circumstances taking all the facts into account what could the reasonable consumer have expected in terms of safety in terms of primarily safety but in terms of many other things as to uh, how the car performs on the road etc etc and you kind of take this approach and you say based on this idea of what the consumer was allowed or the reasonable consumer was allowed to expect from the product the did the product actually meet this test or not now this is in any case a slightly vague test right it depends on us formulating the notion of consumers or a reasonable consumer in a, in a very in very specific terms but it becomes increasingly problematic when you apply it to frontier technologies like self driven cars why because these are 
just entering the market you you don't know at the moment what a reasonable consumer reasonable consumer actually has very messed up expectations from these technologies right lay people and their understanding of a self driven car is actually very they, they think of it as something sci fi right straight out of sci fi and therefore they will straight away jump to concluding that this will completely drive itself whereas the reality is that autonomous behavior in cars is a gradient it's not one day a car is not autonomous and the next day it complete becomes completely self driven in fact there are standards which divide autonomous behavior in cars into six gradients um and and depending on how much the car is automated it will fall in one of those places so because there is all of this back end knowledge which is not yet common knowledge we can't formulate consumer expectation test very properly and it will become highly subjective and therefore problematic the second test is something called a risk utility test what what risk utility test does is that it asks that how much more effort or expenditure should have been uh, made into safety r&d without kind of making the product commercially non viable uh, no, uh, basically let's let's put it this way that the, the if if i put in more money than this in the safety r&d i would not have been able to sell this car at a at a you know a competitive rate in the market or this product at a competitive rate in the market we set that standard and then we ask whether all of that expenditure and 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 due diligence was actually put into the car right and if it were put it, it, it into the car and yet uh, the car ended up kind of defective it, it ended up malfunctioning we do not hold it designers liable this has been one of the approaches that has been presented in law around the world right um this will also pose problems when you apply it to newer cars and kind of for the similar reason when when you talk about self driven cars uh, the risk utility approach test is asking questions which are very very difficult to answer because once again the industry is nascent we don't know how much um first of all we don't know what the competitive you know market is like because the market is still form forming many of the major companies which which kind of have dominated automobile industry for hundreds of years or at least decades are very fresh entrants into the market and most of the self driven cars are at the moment not really into the consumer market right they are mostly either getting tested or they are being used by bigger corporations such as uber because uber can afford to kind of invest into concepts like that the consumer market especially in countries outside very limited areas in us and certain other countries is practically non existent so we don't we don't have a good answer to the question of how much effort should have been put into making this product um you know safe without also undermining its final marketability so you will see that these problems continue to arise of course there is also the possibility that the defect may not be in the design but in the manufacturing this is relatively easier because designing is an open ended question how do you design has open ended possibilities but once you have decided that this is the design then manufacturing defect is easier for us to kind of pinpoint because all we have to do is compare the final product with what was intended to be created if it doesn't match you have a manufacturing defect this will continue to remain relatively easy but it will still not be completely easy because as i have already mentioned um algorithms end up improving themselves changing themselves and the process they will uh, become something different from what was intended right because the design is no longer fixed it's relatively dynamic now it's not the hardware design necessarily but but it is hardware performance based upon software design which changes itself over over a certain period of time and then of course there are information defects information defects arise from something that is known as the duty to train which basically is very simple the idea that sellers of complex products should provide sufficient information to the users who are not expected to be highly tech savvy in order to be able to safely drive this or use this product and this doesn't necessarily apply as i said self driving cars is an example this applies to all sorts of products right um you you can think of this as applying to your appliances that are used in the kitchen more modern appliances such as a vacuum robot cleaner etc etc um and and therefore any variation from this duty 
might create an information defect and that can be uh, the basis of finding product uh, liability. So information defects also need definition. We need to define, the law needs to define where the boundary of information is, how much information is actually needed to be provided and perhaps provide a template, which is what more detailed regulations are expected to do. But at the moment, once again, we don't have detailed rules um, for things like self-driving cars and many other um, newer forms of technology, especially which, which are using AI. Third possibility, now the first was negligence-based tort liability. The second was uh, product liability. And the third is criminal liability. I'll very quickly just touch upon it because I don't think it's very useful to go too deep into it. All I will say is that if you talk about criminal liability in case of um, these technologies, you will still have to fulfill the fundamental requirements of criminal law, right? You will have to show that the product was deliberately designed in a fashion to cause harm. That deliberate intent, that mens rea has to be in, the, in some human being because only then we'll be able to say that the requirements of criminal law have been fulfilled. And at the moment, that's all we have because when we people talk about criminal law in the case of newer technologies such as AI, they kind of start drifting into a direction where they start treating AI itself as a person. But that's a highly contested concept and I'm not discussing uh, that. At the moment, for, for all practical purposes, we don't treat AI as anything other than a mere machine. And therefore, any responsibility, be it criminal, be it civil, doesn't fall upon anyone but other human beings or legal persons, perhaps corporations, especially when you talk about tort liability, corporations can be held responsible. They can be made to pay damages. They can be treated as having the, the, the relevant tort liability. Kunal, uh, I will not be entertaining questions at the moment. Let me finish. And uh, towards the end, uh, the moderator might take certain questions. Moving on. The question I pose now is that these are the current approaches. They are themselves having several applicability issues, several conceptual issues. So are they sufficient, right? This is the question that I asked, but the answer I believe is actually a very quite clear and resounding no. This is not sufficient. And there's one more reason why these are not sufficient. Even if time allows for principles to become more uh, streamlined and, 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 and further, uh, you know, um, legal developments and jurisprudence evolves that kind of streamlines these rules and says, this is how we apply these to self-regulating machines such as self-driving cars. We will, we will still have certain problems left out into our hands. And that's where I come into the concept of ex post versus ex ante regulation. All of these examples that we discussed so far, right? And as I said, these are the go-to responses. When someone asks who's to be held responsible for harm caused by a self-driven car, most people who also who are those who are trained in law will kind of go to these possibilities and say that this is how we decide. But what I want to say is that even if you have these measures in place and even if they are sufficiently clarified over a period of time, they are still not sufficient. Why? Because they are only ex post regulation. In other words, ex post regulation is regulation for legal disputes that has that have already arisen, right? We are talking about a circumstance in which a car accident has already happened. And we are saying what happens now? What you are missing is the possibility that you can actually take other measures before the accident happens, or in more general terms, before a technology causes harm to people, you can still take measures and these measures actually add and supplement to the measures of what happens after the accident has happened. So now you see I am zooming out. You were focused too much into one specific question, but now we see that there's actually a broader framework to understand technology regulation. And that is, what do you do to ensure that technology doesn't cause harm in the first place, not necessarily what we do once harm has actually happened. And what we can do is we can ensure that the car accidents either don't happen at all, or at least that all possible measures to ensure the chances of it and the harm from it are minimized. Or we are better able to deal with post-harm liability allocation. You will see that some ex ante measures, some measures that are taken before the accident happens or the harm happens, are designed to ensure that once the harm has happened, we have a better method of deciding, or we at least have more evidence or more facts to decide 
who do we actually pin the liability upon? And this is known as ex ante regulation. So regulation beyond simply asking who is at fault or how do we compense, uh, compensate for the harm that has happened and goes into asking the question, how do we ensure that harm is either not, not happening at all? How do we stop it from happening in the first place? Or at least minimize the chance of it and ensure that we are able to, we are in a better position to have post harm liability allocation. Ex ante regulation is also not very uncommon. If you think about even regular cars have a lot of ex ante regulations. In a certain way of thinking, traffic rules themselves are ex ante regulation. That's what they are doing, right? Why are they there? They are there to ensure that accidents don't happen. And all sorts of traffic rules are designed around the idea of ensuring that people do not suffer harm when they are on the streets. There's more. You have age limit for driving. Why do you have, have those, right? Ex ante regulation. You're trying to draw a line saying that We'll, we, we hope that drawing this line of this age limit for driving licenses will ensure that people who are in a better capability to drive, the very licensing regime itself is an ex ante regulation. You can't drive unless you have a license. You have seat belts, you have airbags, you, you have some responsibility on the user, like following traffic rules and ensuring that they have a license. You also have some responsibilities on the manufacturers. You have to put seat belts, you have to put airbags, you have to put there are actually four more complex regulations that are in place in several jurisdictions and how you go on designing certain cars. So you, this is something which is there in the idea is present in law. And what we need, therefore, in the case of technology in general, but newer technology such as self-driven car in particular, is a is a, an enhanced focus on ex ante regulation. What ex ante regulation is possible? This is a field of law which is evolving. We still will see more developments, but here are some examples of how do you, in the case of self-driven cars, try to ensure that the harms are minimized. Training sandboxes is a fantastic example. Several jurisdictions have imposed the requirement that before you actually put the car on streets for common people, you train them in limited and defined spaces where you can take measures to ensure that safety is kind of ensured in, in, in the first place, right? Sandbox, the very concept is a concept of limited space where you experiment in order to ensure that the product is safe for use before it goes out into the public domain. So several jurisdictions um, are coming up with this idea that there has to be, there have to be certain training sandboxes for the self-driven cars before they are put into the ordinary streets because ordinary streets are far less regulated than these sandboxes can be. Black boxes, what are black boxes? These are the same black boxes that are used in airlines also. What they help us to do is have a record of what happened. This is particularly true in the case of accidents. So they will only be useful once the accident has happened, correct? They are, until that point, they're just there. But the fact that the law asks us to put these black boxes in the first place is an ex ante regulation. It's asking us to do things before accidents happen so that we have a better idea. They basically tell us who to hold responsible later on. And third, and very important and quickly upcoming is mandatory insurance. What you don't want is all of this legal complication later about who is responsible. What you want is essentially compensation for the victim. And that has historically been achieved barring criminal liability for driving, which is a topic which I've, I've left kind of out because in self-driven cars, it's a very limited possibility. But in most other cases, if there's a harm, what you need primarily is compensation. And what you can achieve that without entering the quagmire of legal principles and how to apply all of them to self-driven cars by simply having an ex ante mandatory insurance regime saying that all drivers, and this is something that has happened, right? UK Automated Electric Vehicles Act 2018 provides for such a case. Uh, and, and, and what it does is for autonomous vehicles, it says you have to have, it basically extends the existing regime. And that's true for India also. Even in India, we have a regime which is which provides a mandatory first party as well as third party insurance. And that's true for UK as well, where they have already by law extended it to autonomous vehicles. So what you see here is the spectrum of regulation broadening. And and this, this broadening has great positives, right? Because what it does is it allows more certainty to be there. The, the public, the regulators, the manufacturers, the users, everyone has a better knowledge of what to expect when, when using technology. 
and uh, what it also does is 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 kind of sets expectations for everyone um and and does not leave us leave people without remedy once harms have happened what it does further is it forces the manufacturers to take a lot of actions to ensure that their products are safe so it it does enhance safety for everyone now what what this discussion has happened so far for for um kind of self driven cars applies to all technologies but it does apply to different technologies in different fashion and i'll talk about that in a minute so um let's first clarify the fact that i don't mean to say that ex post and ex ante um approaches are watertight compartments sometimes you will see that the effect of uh, an an ex post rule kind of finds its way back into ex ante by action by designers one of them is product liability for information defect right so when you have an information defect in the first place uh you will hold the manufacturer liable but this will only happen once the harm has happened right you will you will find perhaps factually that the manufacturer had not put sufficient information in the manuals but because this is present it kind of flows back in time and what manufacturer does is it ensures that compliance has happened right and that once the 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 harm has actually happened then there is no requirement or uh, at least there's no possibility that the manufacturer can be held liable so there it's it's not watertight it kind of there's a there's a two way relationship between these two kinds of regulation but zooming out does tell you that merely focusing on what happens after harm has happened is actually very very insufficient so this is exactly what i have said here this distinction applied to technology in general so far i have been giving you the example of self driven cars but it applies to any form of technology i'll give you a quick example in the proposed regulation of ai by eu if you look at what european union is trying to do with a v ai you will notice that they are trying to put in a regime which says first of all we'll treat all ai separately depending on how much risk they pose to fundamental rights and safety of people and then the two categories in between high risk and ai with specific transparency obligations will have several extenuating measures in place to ensure and this is all ai it doesn't matter where you are using it right you can use it in self driving cars but you can use it in alexa and these will apply you will use it in social media these will apply you will you can use it in recommender systems this will apply irrespective of where you apply ai algorithms this will this law will continue to have an application and as long as your use of ai is a high risk use of ai um i'm not going into what they have categorized as high risk because of limited time at the moment you can look into that but primarily their idea is that anything which poses risk to safety or fundamental rights of citizens of european union is high risk and they say that if your product is high risk you basically have to do many things before you launch the product this is what the excellent regulation before you launch the product what do you have to do some examples you have to do a lot of due diligence and documentation you have to ensure that many things have many inspections many safety tests and trainings have been done and all of that has been documented before you launch the product you have to put a lot of transparency through information to the user right every time a user uses the product they have to receive by law certain risk information uh if which if you don't provide you are in violation of law this actually a lot more they are asking for conformity assessment and this will be performed in a very detailed and complex process by a regulator dedicated specifically for this purpose and they will look at the ai all possible applications of that ai and they will go into the question of whether it conforms with eu laws in general but fundamental rights and safety regulations in particular and then they will provide certification and only if you have certification will you be allowed to use this or else uh, the regulatory action will be taken against the parties producing these ai systems they also have in certain cases impact assessments when when the regulator is not sure what impact these will have they will ask the manufacturers to perform impact assessments before they can kind of give it a green signal or decide not to give it a green signal so this is all examples of how a regulation um, takes place in the case of technology the regulation will vary depending on what aspect of technology you are looking at so there will be a lot of sui generis regulation when i have said sui generis regulation what i mean is tailored regulation for specific context one good example 
another another one which deeply you know is interwoven with regulation of technology is gdpr and it's a good example of such a unique regime in place and if you look closely at gdpr you will say that it has both ex ante and ex post measures in fact it has a much larger almost disproportionate focus upon ex ante measures what it does is it says before the data is collected or before the data rights are violated all of these measures have to be taken place if those measures are not taken even if the rights are not violated eventually look at this fact even if the rights are not violated eventually but you have failed to take these measures we will hold you responsible under law this is a clear example and in fact bulk of gdpr is dedicated to doing this but there are parts of gdpr which also talks about what happens once the right has been violated then you approach the uh, authorities and courts etc etc so both are present present but in what proportion you put both is a regulator's choice is a policy choice that the law has to make and it will be tailored depending on many things one of course is a field of technology but it will also be tailored depending on which jurisdiction you are in different jurisdictions have different visions different policies different approaches to this and they they choose to uh, regulate it's the same piece of technology in a very different fashion the way eu deals with data protection the way china deals with eu data protection is actually very very different from each other but i will try to kind of conclude now um because it's 5:40 already so what i've tried to show you is that we need to kind of look at a broader picture but in the concluding slides i'll, I'll tell you that we need to actually broaden our scope even further why so major reason why we need to do that is because in general technology regulation is a complex endeavor when i say complex many things all regulation is complex but the peculiar nature of technology is that it it has the power to modify the terms of engagement of law making itself right so so far law making processes have been like a spectator standing outside the arena and looking inside the arena of human activities and regulating it when when you deal with technology regulation that distinction that outsider perspective into what is being regulated starts getting undermined and what happens is that the very process of law making becomes impacted by what is being regulated which in this case is technology the simplest example of the role of is the role of technology in the form of social media ai algorithms and many other pieces of technology really upon democratic processes right now democratic processes at the heart of very rule making but what technology does is that it changes the very nature of how people engage with each other in in social discourse and political discourse in order to eventually create rules and what it can do one example that is often given but i'll just also say it is the rise of authoritarianism over the past few years now when once you have technology um changing the terms of engagement in such, such a fashion that authoritarian regimes rise how do you then ensure that law making process itself is continues to you know fulfill certain other values which are no longer in in vogue right authoritarianism has consistently undermined the value of liberalism which has allowed all of these modern legal regimes to flourish in the first place so you have this problem and and, and once you have this problem ex ante regulation is a great thing to have but it's also a double edged sword because what it can do is that it can allow these newer regimes to shape technology according to their own will a good example is social media regulation and big tech regulation if 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 you start allowing a lot of ex ante regulation in the space of social media what can happen is censorship what can happen is undermining of the right of free speech which is as i, I hope all of you kind of appreciate is at the core of um free and fair law making processes in in any jurisdiction really so so that's something which is uh, a, a problem and therefore we have to kind of take the whole thing which a pinch of, with a pinch of salt the whole idea of ex ante regulation and that is why this is why we need to further zoom out right as i said i am continuing to zoom out and what we need to do is now no longer just look at regulation of technology what we need to look at is also the ethics of technology this is why ethics becomes relevant because once you have these problems with the very law making processes you need more you need more and you need you get that normativity you can borrow that normativity from ethics because ethics is 
the larger wider scope yes and what's the major difference between ethics and regulation is the enforceability also the concreteness of it right ethics and ethical principles are certainly less concrete than regulation but they are also rele more relevant in the context of technology because you have the aforesaid problems there's another reason why ethics is more important um, than than regulation at least in some cases when it comes to technology and that is that is a concept that that a philosopher called Sharon Weller has called techno social opacity and what she says is that because technology keeps on changing the terms of engagement it becomes very hard for us to predict how technology will be shaped in the times to come the fact that we that our powers of foreseeability of how technology and society will evolve even in short term even in terms as short as a decade what it does is it it, it makes ex ante regulation very very problematic right because then it, it a lot of it becomes far less precise than it should be and therefore you need more and more ethics in this particular case so ethics continues to remain important and ethics has a lot of role to play but ethics also has its own set of kind of um drawbacks one of which is of course the lack they they, they, con they continue to by be by their very nature slightly vague and unenforceable so it's a it's kind of a um, to and fro process. You kind of zoom out, see what is required in a bigger framework, then zoom in and look at specific regulations, then continue doing this process because we can't, and we, we, are, we are no longer in an era where we can be satisfied with a set of rules which continue to be valid for a very long time to come. We need to continually re-evaluate our rules in view of changing circumstances in the in the view of evolving dynamics of society polity and technology but but before i conclude i do like to i would like to highlight or kind of uh, clarify something when it, when people say ethics of technology they, they kind of make the same error that that people make when they talk about regulation right people even in ethics of technology think that this is what ethics is this is an example of which is often quoted. And once again, we go back to self-driven cars. What is the ethical action to take, right? When there are four people on the street and four people on the car, and this is just one example, there are actually many examples of this type. Whether you should choose harming the four drivers over the four people. What if there's only one person on the street? Is it okay to kind of divert the car's direction and kill one person in order to save four people's lives? This is an interesting question, but my 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 um, argument is this is once again a very narrow approach to looking at ethics. You're simply looking, you're simply zooming at it at a very limited set of circumstances and saying what? I'm not saying that this circumstance might not arise, but the, the number of times this will arise is actually far, far more limited than people think. You can actually zoom out once again and look at a broader picture and think of broader ethical principles right so this is where we go from x we, we we talk about ex ante and ex post ethics also not just regulation even in ethics you can kind of have the same division between ex ante and ex post approaches as was the case in regulation what you are doing in in the case of a self-driving car this particular example that i showed in a minute back is we are focusing on a very specific circumstance when when the when the options are narrowed down already. You don't have a third option really. But in in many other circumstances, the number of options, the way you design your streets, the way you design your cars, uh, the way you design your rules, you have a lot of agency, a lot of possibilities. And ethics actually has a lot of role to play there as well, right? So therefore, what we need to do when we talk about ethics is move from ethical conundrums, right? complicated ethical problems like like the trolley problem that I just showed you to larger ethical principles which need to be followed in in all circumstances not circumstances where the choices are limited and perhaps also and this is one of the most contentious aspects a shift from rule-based ethics to agent-based ethics um, I'll not go too deep into it but just to give you an introduction of the meaning is that most of the ethics at the moment focuses on the rules through which you make decision, right? So, for example, the utilitarian theory of ethics tells us that the way you make this decision is you ask 
which decision will maximize the utility or the happiness in the society overall and accordingly you take a decision so what what utilitarian theory does is it gives us a rule an ethical rule in this case to decide what to do but one argument goes that merely having ethical rules in place will not be sufficient you can already see the problem with having that approach in in, in this case how do you determine what maximizes the welfare of the society right who are these individuals how are their lives and the, and their deaths going to impact the society who deserves to live and who deserves to die these are difficult questions you can't just put a number on them and because of that you the focus may be required for us to shift from these rules of ethics which tell us what to do and what not to do to a, to to focusing on people right and asking people to behave morally um through perhaps certain standards and guidelines and and there, there are ethical theories in that area as well uh but this shift is perhaps something we require in the times to come with that i conclude i hope uh, within time um and in summary uh, my argument is that newer forms of technology force us to be more active and more dynamic when it comes to regulating technology they force us to not just look at specific problems and and solve them using traditional rules and principles but continually reevaluate our principles by zooming out looking at the broader framework perhaps even moving from purely regulatory matters to ethical matters and back and thereby um, decide what the actual regulation should be so with that i conclude and uh, ashutosh i believe if there are any questions they, uh, then i'll be happy to take them uh, sure sir thank you sir i hope all of you enjoyed this amazing presentation i know i did now as professor said uh, he can take some uh, questions and first we will refer to the questions that were sent uh, in the chat i believe kunal had a question and at this point you can also raise your hands or and uh, yeah write your questions in the chat yeah kunal go ahead Uh, you are not audible, Kunal. I think. Yeah, I can't. We can't hear you, Kunal. In the meantime, uh, perhaps can look at other questions. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. So, does anyone else have a question from the list of attendees? If yes, then you can raise your hands or type in the chat. As I said it earlier. Yeah, sure. You can type it in the chat, and uh, in the meantime, we can discuss questions that were sent to us during the uh, presentation, Professor. If that is okay. Sure. So one of the questions was, how would these approaches apply to something as simple as social media, where a technology is used by a large number of people? how would people on social media or using it come to know of how to conduct themselves in a particular manner right um so i think the crux of my presentation is that there's no easy answer to this question and that there's no straightforward answer to this question um especially when it comes to social media um in fact our own experience kind of is is not that great at the moment we we saw in, in india recent guidelines concerning social media regulation um and what they did is that they created a possibility of state overreach what they did is that they that that they allowed state authorities to ask intermediaries to track the actual identity of the um of the sender of a particular message now this is just one example where we where we basically see an overreach um and why this is an overreach is that this can lead um to uh, stigmatization this can lead to um some sort of Uh, you know a witch hunt that that the government can launch against whatever suits their political agenda etc and can in legal terms undermine people's fundamental rights so this continues to be a problem um but um protection of people's fundamental rights continues to remain an important touchstone upon which we need to evaluate the regulations as to the question of where we have where we will find these regulations well that's simple right you can you will find them 
uh, just where, where where you find every other law. Um, uh, but but in the case of social media, it's not just government made law. You might also want to if you if you want to know. Uh, you might also want to see the rules and regulations proposed by the intermediaries themselves. Facebook has a certain set of guidelines. Same is the case with every other social media platform, YouTube, Twitter. They have set of guidelines uh, in terms of what people are allowed to do and what is prohibited. But the challenge in the times to come is to bring these rules in um, alignment with not just what the state or the public interest is, but also the larger values of the society. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, I'm sure it does. Uh, Anshuman has raised his hand, so Anshuman, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, sir, my uh, question was related to uh, basically whether we should, uh, you know, legislate uh, algorithmic design and uh, regulate that uh, also. Like, for example, what kind of, uh, you know, minimum threshold of data that you should use to train your algorithms and what all you should consider before designing your algorithms so that like there's no sort of like uh, something that you miss or something or some bias creeps in you know into the data set or something else so right. uh, that was my question so it's it's a good point algorithmic design in general could be subject to regulation it will require however a lot of um, investment into into properly um, calibrated regulatory authorities, you can't have these calibrations at the level of legislation. That's just a given. You need not just regulations, but regulatory authorities and dynamic process of, uh, you know, coming up with guidelines and, and standards, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which, which ensure uh, that, you know, these more specific details are kind of regulated. Um, I particularly doubt that you will be able to regulate the question of how much data is to be used because this will as require us to go into the details of every single specific case um which which will force um ai manufacturers through a regulatory rigmarole which is too onerous upon them right um, one of the biggest problems with doing uh, or going to this you know depth with regulating algorithmic design is that is the kind of economic burden it puts upon designers and 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 the way it therefore will eventually harm uh, innovation so that balancing is required but but yes in general algorithms and even algorithmic design can be uh, regulated what you will need and this is what you get in the proposed eu act that i was talking about you get a regulator and then you get a, a set of rules that the regulator will eventually come up with uh, which will tell us more specific details of how like, algorithms have to be designed Okay, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so, sir, another question that we had was, uh, how would the approaches be enforced considering different jurisdictions across the globe? Is there a central body that could see the enforcement of these approaches or are legal measures not required for the enforcement? First of all, there will be many cases of use of technology which will not be transnational in character. So you don't necessarily need cross-border enforcement. But yes, there will be other cases in which that will be true. Uh, and this is not a new problem. This problem has existed uh, for long, and this has become uh, very severe ever since internet came into existence. So the story of internet tells us that cross-border cooperation is very ad hoc in character. We have failed uh, as a global community to have an international treaty under the regulation of internet. We regulate very specific aspects of it that too don't deal with harms. They deal with how to design of what is also called internet governance, how to ensure that internet continues to function. Um, because that's where we, you need a bare minimum global cooperation. And that's also not very contentious because it's a, mostly of most of it is technical in character. But when it comes to what can and cannot be done, um, it's very jurisdiction specific. Cross-border cooperation, um, Okay, the one of the ways that it can be done, I think one of the lessons that once again we can learn from EU is that we shift our focus from perpetrators to intermediaries. That's what legal uh, law has always done since, ever since it, the kind of internet became a big thing. We have realized that if, let's say, harmful content, illegal content is being posted upon internet um, by private actors 
in XYZ country. One option is to go after them, right? That would require you to perhaps, um, there, there, there's a concept called letter surrogatory where the ministry of this country sends a request to the ministry of that other country for cooperation, for gathering evidence and for prosecution. And then you can look into extradition treaties, et cetera, et cetera. Mutual legal assistance treaties there are almost 30 plus mutual legal assistance treaties that India has with other countries. But these are all very complex. What the law instead does is that it says, we'll just let them be and we'll focus on the intermediaries and the bigger intermediaries in that. So Facebook, your Google, your Twitter, and these other platforms, which enable access to these websites. Also the uh, tech service providers, right? Your, your BSNLs and ARTs and geos, uh, which can be forced to take actions and, and, and kind of block access to specific websites. So this is this is where the focus of the law enforcement authorities has been. Um, but when, when push comes to shove, there are certain red line areas where you need to take action, especially when it's a matter of national security, when you have direct terrorist uh, matters, you know, that, that undermine national security. Other, other forms of criminal behavior, um, such as child pornography. US has a good history of child pornography being one area where they fo forget the intermediaries and the, go after the perpetrators. Especially when they can, especially when they um, when the perpetrators are within their own jurisdiction. So it's a it's a choice that the law enforcement has to make. But these are the factors which will help them in making the choices. Thank you, sir. Uh, now Kunal has written his question in the chat box. If we allow the self-driven car in the Indian market, to whom would we uh, give driving license and hold more responsible? The person seated in driving seat and doing nothing, the owner of the vehicle or manufacturer who manufactures the defected car or uh, AI algorithm who learned the wrong thing during the learning be responsible for the accident? I can't answer this question, uh, but I can tell you what factors are relevant. Um, I think part of it we already discussed earlier um, that um, I am pretty sure some sort of licensing. I, I don't know whether you, whether the law would end up calling it license, but some some sort of regulatory approval will necessarily be required for both the manufacturer and the driver, right? Perhaps the drivers end will end up calling it license at the manufacturers end. We might end up calling it something else. Uh, that will that will depend upon many factors. That's hard for me to articulate at the moment. But we will certainly have approvals required at both levels. I'm, I'm fairly sure that manufacturers will also have certain regulatory approvals required and, um, and, and drivers too. At the moment, I think one of the reasons why this question is being asked is we are asking ourselves the question, is driver responsible? Um, but I don't think the law is going to make the driver um, kind of be exculpated from legal responsibility anytime soon. Um, the driver is going to continue to remain legally responsible. In fact, let me quickly share, many of you might already know that in the Uber matter that I mentioned earlier, it's the person in the driving seat who is actually being charged at the moment in US. So you will, you will continue to see in the foreseeable future human drivers being legally and morally responsible, even if there is... Um, uh, you know, if, even if self-driven cars are kind of there on the streets. And that is why you will have a regulation which ensures that this driver is qualified to handle, right, the self-regulated car, the, sorry, the self-driven car. Uh, they will have to have some training in order to kind of know when to take over because one of the biggest debates within the self-driving space is what's the standard where the car should prompt the driver to take over. And this will continue to happen because the cars are not going to be that level of autonomous for the foreseeable future. So this is what I can tell you. I seriously doubt that AI algorithm would be required to get a license because AI algorithms will be treated as the product of the manufacturing company. And therefore, yeah, I, I think it's the manufacturing company who will continue to remain the focus of the regulators. Thank you for the answer, sir. Now, I believe Anshuman, you can go ahead. You had raised your hand. Uh, yes, sir. I wanted your opinion on uh, this very thing, uh, as in where you stand on this 
uh, you know, debate sort of uh, whether the law and technology both should progress in a way that the driver uh, should be held responsible for, uh, like, for example, I think Waymo, the Google uh, mm. autonomous uh, branch, mm -hmm. I think th what they're trying to do is like cut out the human element out of the equation and go straight to like autonomous mm -hmm. level four or five cars because, mm -hmm. and I sort of agree with the theory that, uh, you know, when you put the burden on the uh, driver mm -hmm. and you expect them to pay attention throughout, realistically, mm -hmm. they won't do that. So you're mm -hmm. putting them in a situation where an accident is likely to happen, uh, like an unavoidable accident is uh, will happen uh, because, uh, you know, they weren't paying attention because obviously they weren't paying attention because like you said to the lame and they see it as, uh, mm. you know, infallible thing. So yeah. I want to get your opinion on both the regulation as well as the technology. Uh, so I, I get it that you are asking me whether I believe that the drivers should continue to be held responsible. Right. That's the question. Yeah. And whether the technology should uh, like progress in a way that you know, like the Waymo approach or basically like the other companies, what the other companies are doing, like Tesla and all, like right. involving sure. the human. Yeah. I, I, I seriously think that the realistic answer is that humans will continue to be held responsible. And it would be very unwise of these technology companies to promote themselves and their products in such a fashion that it creates the sense in the public that the cars are truly fully autonomous. I think if they have good legal teams, I'm sure these legal teams will advise Google and Tesla to be very clear about how they project their products, right? Um, this should definitely happen at the level of the sale. Okay, so there are two levels to it, the sale level and the marketing level. I'm, I'm, I'm at the moment not saying so much, uh, talking so much about regulation, but in terms of what I believe is a relevant factor. At the level of sale, you know, there is an agreement between the buyer and the seller. This agreement should have terms of responsibility that the driver will continue to have. And these should be uh, clarified. These should not be hidden in the fine print, right? And even at the level of marketing, I think they would be unwise to market their products. I, I, get, I get the temptation that these companies have at the moment to market their products. And that's the USP, right? Why would people buy? Um, but because self-driven car technology has a long way to go, has a long way. Already it has kind of reached the plateau. The cars are continuing to fail in some areas um, and, and, and we are not actually going to see proliferation of self-driven cars in the next five years, at least. Uh, so I, I think that it would be wise for these companies to, to have overall transparency, saying that while there are degrees of autonomy to the car the drivers are expected to be vigilant and and perhaps in more detailed guidelines they can say what kind of vigilance is required uh, or expected from the drivers when it comes to law um i don't know whether the law will prescribe this but it could it could say that there has to be a transparency obligation we'll we'll see how that evolves that might be a good thing to regulate i i, I believe so okay sir thank you Uh, so, sir, Kunal had a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. So, who will be the uh, driver in the case of an autonomous vehicle? If there is a rear seat and if the person in the rear seat is uh, controlling the car, will he be held uh, as the driver or the person just sitting in the driving seat? That depends on the design of the car. That depends on the design of the car. Once again, realistically speaking, it's not going to be the person sitting in the rear seat. I don't think. Um, <clears throat> We'll reach that level of autonomous cars anytime soon where you could just sit at the back and let the car drive itself and have a vacant seat in the front. I think that they will continue to remain a control panel, a steering wheel of sorts uh, in the cars in, in, in the foreseeable future and therefore the person in the driver's seat. Um, that's that's my uh, expectation from the way I see the self-driving cars in, evolving. Um, but... But as I said, techno social opacity, we don't know uh, whether this will continue to hold true in five to 10 years from now. Uh, thank you, sir. Since we are running short on time, Kunal, if you could unmute and answer the question, that would be great. Otherwise, we could just conclude the session. Like, 
uh, you had a question right i think he had two questions and he asked both oh okay uh, sure so thank you again professor for answering those questions and for the great presentation uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us and this concludes the webinar thank you all for attending we hope you have learned and enjoyed this presentation i would also like to specifically thank the board members of the digital future parvati harsh shruti and jasleen for making this webinar possible thank you thank you everyone